remote open book actuarial exams. I think Canada is onto something here. Okay, I just recently learned about the new actuarial accreditation system that the CIA has implemented for Canada. And honestly, I think there's a lot of good things here that a lot of other organizations should implement too. By the way, she is not talking about the undercover spy type of CIA. She's talking about the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. It is all about risk and insurance and far, far, far more thrilling. First, did I mention remote open book actuarial exams? Why do some organizations still require you to go to a test center to take an exam? Why do you have to memorize so much stuff that you're never really going to need to know off the top of your head in real life while you're working as an actuary? Well, no longer the case for Canadians, sort of. At this time, it really only applies for the fellowship exams, which are the exams that you take after you've already become an associate. But hey, maybe sometime they'll start implementing this for the preliminary exams too, the exams that you take to get to associate level. But there is actually a new benefit for associate level exams too. You can almost get your full associateship through school. You see, some other organizations allow you to get good enough grades in certain courses in order to get an exemption for the exam or a credit for the exam, which I'm showing you on the screen right now. But that means that even when you go to school to get an actuarial degree, you still have to go outside of your education and take exams, whether it be while you're still in school or whether it be after, you still have to do extra on top of your degree. But with the CIA's new process, that is not the case. You can become an associate shortly after you graduate. You only have to pass a couple modules, take a professionalism course, and pass one more exam, the capstone exam. And then you are an associate. So let's talk about this capstone exam. This is a six hour exam that consists of two different parts. And basically the purpose of this exam is to take everything you've learned in your education or the actuarial exams and apply it to real life situations. That means it's not like the other exams that you've taken in the past. It's going to be a lot more hands on solving an actual problem and analyzing data in real life. You'll use things like Excel and R. This too is an open book remote exam so you don't have to go to a test center and this is really going to be the only exam that you have to take outside of school if you get an actuarial degree. Give this video a thumbs up if you like that. Now this pathway is so streamlined it really means that your education actually counts for something with other organizations and in the past with the CIA too. I've kind of felt like your education is just a box you're ticking off. It kind of feels redundant because you still have to take these exams anyway and the exams are what the employers really care about because that's what gets you the credentials. But this makes it so much more efficient because you don't have to take all those extra exams. Your education really counts for something. But Bria, why do employers almost always require some sort of bachelor's degree even though the exam test your knowledge anyway. You know, I can see how that doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense. I've helped many future actuaries in our actuary accelerator community to get into actuarial jobs without having much background in probability and statistics, but they are still able to be successful. So I'm not really sure why that is and I don't fully agree with it, but that's a topic for a different video. Now back to the scheduled content. Now I talked about getting an actuarial degree, but the truth is there are actually only at least at the time of recording this 11 schools that you can go to to get your actuarial degree that will be able to count towards your actuarial associateship designation. These are what the CIA has deemed the recognized actuarial degrees. But what if you can't get into one of those schools or what if you can't get into the right program or what if you're already graduated and you aren't going to go back to school? Well, in that case, you're basically in the same boat as everyone else. You will have to get your associateship through the Society of Actuaries or CAS. And then once you get that associateship, you'll be able to take a module through the CIA and the professionalism course through the CIA. And that will allow you to get your CIA associateship. So there's just a little bit extra you have to do on top of the SOA or CADS associateship. Now I'd say that more and more great prospects for the actuarial career are deciding to go into other careers because the process is just so difficult that it almost makes 
makes it feel like they're doing so much extra redundant work that is not worth it anymore. And I totally understand feeling like that. But I think the CIA has done an amazing job at streamlining this process so that it is way more efficient than it ever has been in the past. I love that they've added remote and open book exams and I also love the fact that you can now be almost an associate by the time you've graduated school. Even though I do cringe a little bit thinking about how much extra work I had to do that you don't have to do now, but I'm happy for you about it. <laughs> Some other things that I would love to see implemented in other organizations or maybe in the CIA would be a requirement for real world experience. I do not think that anyone should be able to be an associate without having any real actuarial work experience. Having those credentials is a big deal and there's so much that you learn on the job that you do not learn through exams or schooling. So if I were to add something to this, I'd love to see that sort of a requirement, maybe an internship as a requirement or some sort of related experience being a requirement. And that's something we obviously talk about a lot on this channel and in our Actuary Accelerator community, but it needs to be part of the requirements. I'd also love to see the ability for exam takers to be able to see what they got wrong on the exam. Right now, when you pass an actuarial exam or and even when you fail, you don't actually get to see what your answers were and how they compare to the actual answer. You don't get to learn from your mistakes. And I don't think that's really beneficial for candidates. It would give them so much more ability to learn from their mistakes and to know where they have to focus their time. Lastly, I wish that you would be able to decide on whether you want to go the SOA route or the CAS route, so the property insurance route or the life and health insurance route later on in your career with the CIA right now, how it's set up so that you can get an actuarial degree and that counts towards your associateship. You actually don't have to decide what type of insurance you want to specialize in. If you are someone that has to go through the exam process, you're going to have to decide on the SOA route or the CAS route after your second exam. So for your third exam, and that is really tough because a lot of the time you don't know what type of insurance you want to get into and oftentimes you don't even have a job yet. So you don't know what type of work you're gonna be doing. So is there anything that you would like to see added to your country's accreditation system for actuaries? Is there anything you like here that you wish was added? Is there anything you don't like? Let me know down in the comments. I'm really curious to see what you guys think about this because I'm actually kind of loving it. But more importantly, maybe, just maybe, if your organization in the future decides to revamp their system, maybe they'll watch this video. Maybe they will read the comments down below and that will give them insight into what people like you, future actuaries, really want. So don't hesitate, don't hold back, put your thoughts right down below and I will certainly read through every single one of them. Now as a quick side note here, I have tried to get all the details right in this video but if I later find out that I mentioned anything that was incorrect, I will make sure to put it into the description of this video right down below. So go check that for updates. Okay, so usually I have my idea of what I'm going to talk about for my story already planned a few weeks ahead of actually recording. But today, something happened that I just felt I needed to share. I did something really, really silly. Okay, so last night, actually for the past few days, I have been catching out of the corner of my eye a little red light on the dashboard of my car when I've been driving and I've never really been able to see what it was and I actually wasn't even 100% sure that there was any light because I was never actually getting a glimpse at it. I just thought I saw it out of the corner of my eye. But last night I was driving home from my soccer game, late 11 o'clock at night, and I noticed a really quick flash of a red light and it was my oil light. I thought, oh, okay, so I really have been seeing a little light there. I went home, checked my oil, and there was basically nothing left in there. And that's not good. My dad always tells me I should check my oil every single month. And do I do that? No, I, I never do. Um, because I always just assume that this oil light is gonna come on when the levels of oil get low. But I guess it didn't this time and it's, it just flickered a little bit. I was lucky to see it, but the oil was so, so, so low. So this morning, I quickly ran to our closest Walmart, got some oil, put it in the car, and went on my way. However, I was smelling like a really strong oil smell, and I thought, that's really weird. When I got home, 
I opened up the hood and just checked on it. I was like, why is it smelling so strongly like oil? Well, it turns out when I closed the hood, I did not put the lid back on to where I put my oil into the car. So there were splatters of oil everywhere. And where did the lid go? I do not know. I'm checking all in my engine to see if it fell down there. I didn't see it on the floor of my garage. It wasn't in my driveway. So I went for a walk and after about, I don't know, seven, eight minutes of walking, I found my oil cap on the ground. Okay, so that is one story, but this has happened before. <laughs> I am, I forget so, so, so many things. Uh, I have forgotten my kids' shoes on top of the car and actually we went for a walk to find those and found them in a very similar spot to where I found the oil cap. I've also left a CD on the top of my car which we ended up finding down the street. So luckily I do end up finding these things that I forget on the roof of my car before I start driving. Um, but sometimes they're not in quite the same condition as they were when I when I left them up there. I forget so many things and guys I really need help with this. I'm hoping that decluttering my home and trying to get all that stuff off my mind of all this these things I need to do hopefully that helps a little bit with it because I do think that that is something that contributes to it a lot is just I have like a hundred things going through my mind at any one given time and that means that I drop the ball on a lot of those things. Let me know if you ever run into these types of situations. What have you forgot? Make me feel a little better. Let me know down in the comments. Bye everyone.